Hello and welcome to Sun Spotlight. I am your host, Charisma. Grateful to be back for another episode. In addition to these interviews that I do every Thursday at noon, I also write a weekly column for the Philadelphia Sunday Sun, which you can read on newsstands every Friday. You can also check us out online at www.philosun.com and be sure to follow the Philadelphia Sunday Sun on all social media platforms. Today, I am thrilled to be speaking with Kyle Bowser. Mr. Bowser is the Senior Vice President of the NAACP's Hollywood Bureau, and he is the mastermind behind an incredible event called Be In The Biz, which is coming to Philadelphia this Saturday. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to Sun Spotlight, Kyle Bowser. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So my fellow Philadelphia native, <laughs> Yeah. When did uh, your love for storytelling and, and entertainment start? You know, I'm I'm so happy that you referred to me as a Philadelphia native because I've lived now in Los Angeles for just over 30 years. But Philly is always going to be home for me. And I have to remind people of that. Um, and I think it is, you know, my youth in Philadelphia that really sort of turned me into a storyteller. Um, there was just so many fascinating adventures, fascinating characters, people in my life who, um, who really made an impression on me and made me realize that the, the stories that we tell really end up being our legacy. Um, and so I think that's where it all began. And from there, what, what helped you to kind of tailor what direction you wanted to go in? Because as I was reading up on you, I'm like, you've literally done something in like every facet of entertainment. <laughs> so... <laughs> How did yeah. you kind of figure out what that path was going to be like for you? You know, I wish I could claim that all of that was by design. Um, but I think what I've done throughout my life is sort of yielded to the gravitational pull of whatever the universe or whatever the, the, the higher power has in store for me. Um, one, one definite uh, break that I got was as I was graduating from college, my father purchased the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia on Broad Street. Wow, uh, dad used to perform there. Yeah, your dad used to perform there? Wow. Yeah, it used to be like the Uptown Theater days, and I'm like... Right. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I never attended the Uptown when it had its heyday in the 50s and 60s, but I heard so many stories. There again, Gary, there again, we go about storytelling, but I heard so many stories about how many wonderful performers were there and just how electric it was. So when my dad purchased the building, uh, it had been closed for many years. A lot of people thought he was crazy, uh, like no one's ever going to go back there again. But he had a vision. Not only did, was there the 2,000-seat theater, but above that there, was a, there is a five-story office building structure. And uh, he converted that into a private nightclub. And so I was graduating from college. He hired me to help him develop the project uh, and work there once we were open. Um, and that really was sort of a, bap a baptism for me in the entertainment industry for theater management and concert promotion and managing people, um, negotiating contracts. Uh, it was it really was um, a learning experience that I, I'm uh, always indebted to my dad for providing me with. Uh, from there, I went to Atlantic City and was an entertainment manager at Harris Casino for a couple of years. Okay. There, I had unlimited budgets to spend on talent and on equipment. And I had a whole staff of technicians that reported to me. So that was a completely different end of the spectrum in terms of the, 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 the robustness of, uh, of the operation. So after Harris, I ended up going to law school. And uh, that sent me in a completely different direction. First thing it did was it taught me that, um, that I had the acumen to be more involved in the behind the scenes of the entertainment industry, yeah. um, to really be a, uh, a participant in how business is done in the industry. And so after law school, I moved to Los Angeles and started working for Fox Television, developing content for them. Um, and this was during Fox's heyday. Actually, they were just coming into their heyday. We weren't even broadcasting seven days a week at that point. But some of the more popular shows on the air were shows that I was responsible for managing. So like In Living Color and Rock, um, okay. worked on the Martin Bye. Show. 
I left those that that place and went on to HBO. And there again was developing new content. I did a show with Bernie Mac. Uh, I did another show called Trial by Jury. And so by this time now, I'm, I'm sort of firmly implanted in the industry. I'm not necessarily a guy that's making the final decision on everything, but I'm close to that guy yeah. or, or girl. And, and really understanding how all the pieces of the puzzle fit in. And it was around that time that I thought to myself, it would be so great if I could share this kind of information with folks back at home or folks around the country who like myself were aspiring to be in those rooms, but just didn't have the access. Yeah. Um, and so I started producing on my own and started getting some, you know, some breaks, some shows on the air and getting some projects done. Uh, got a lot of no's, probably more no's than yeses, but the yeses were enough to sustain me. Yeah. Um, and again, it was during that time that I thought, you know, I want to put together a traveling symposium. I want to travel the country and bring in professionals from Los Angeles and from New York to share their insight, share the information. Um, and so we created this concept called Be in the Biz and started pitching it around town for some corporate support and thought we had a deal with Disney years ago, but unfortunately we weren't able to close the deal. Okay. Um, then eventually I started working for the NAACP. Yeah. And this was sort of like the sweet spot for me because in my youth in Philadelphia, my dad and my uncle were very civically involved. They were very, um, my family. very committed to making sure that the community had its equity stake in everything that was happening in the city. And so I, I was raised in that kind of energy. Um, so now to be able to combine that with this, this entertainment career that I had carved out for myself really felt like the right place for me. And so I head up the NAACP Hollywood Bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, we really engage with the studios and the networks and the agencies and the guilds and all everybody that's working in the industry to try to bring about equitable outcomes. Um, first equitable opportunity that lead to equitable outcomes. Which is uh, we, so necessary. I, I don't okay. mean to cut you off. I, it's just, it's so necessary. Um, my entire- why, Let me tell you why it's, it's necessary, not just for the sake of the individuals like you and me who, who want to be involved and want to get our hands dirty in creativity, but it's really necessary for the benefit of our community. Absolutely. Because the images and the messages that are in media ultimately shape hearts and minds. They, they influence people's perceptions and behaviors about who they are as themselves and how the outside world sees them and, and how they see their proximity to the rest of the world. And so the extent to which we can be a part of that crafting of stories and narratives, the more we can provide our own community with, with healthy outcomes. Yes. And so that's, that's the work I do, at, we all do at the NAACP, and it feels very rewarding to me. I can only imagine. Um, and something you said stood out in my mind, because I just remember having these conversations with my parents and elders as a kid, um, when I first started getting into acting and television and all these things, it was like there was a very small window of things that I was allowed to be as a young Black person, right? Like you can only be this role, you can only sing this kind of music, you can only do this. Like it was very limiting. And so now to have folks like you who are creating opportunities for people to just exist and for us to tell our stories because we're not a monolith, right? So we have all these different stories to tell. Right. Um, having the opportunity to do that, I think, is is wonderful, and it gives people such a, right. a chance to to show up as themselves and to see themselves right. while they're doing it. So, thank you know, you. If, if we wind the clock back all the way back to prehistoric days, right? So there's a bunch of people in a cave, and one guy has a stick. And he decides with that stick, he's going to draw something on the wall of the cave, right? Hieroglyphics. Well, he's the storyteller. He's the one with the stick. He's the one that's getting to decide which version of the story is being told. Somebody, you know, standing away from him may have a different perception of, but they don't have the stick. And so what media has always done is perpetuate the value system of a dominant culture, whoever it is that has the stick. 
whether you're talking about you know hieroglyphics in a cave wall, or you're talking about newsprint, or you're talking about television or film or radio or uh, music, you know, um, any kind of content distribution is going to, in some way, perpetuate a value system. We have to be a part of that process because we have our own values and we need to uphold those values. We can't have them always dictated to us. And we have to understand that the extent to which we emulate someone else's values is actually empowering them and their agenda, not necessarily ours. A thousand percent. What has it been like for you kind of navigating those waters, being in the industry for as long as you have and kind of having to carve out those those opportunities and right. um, give them to people? How has it been for you? So Just the process has evolved. I wish I could say it has gotten better. Uh, I'm more inclined to say it's just gotten different. So when I was growing up, there were only three broadcast networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Uh, we had UHF channels, but they were local, right? But in terms of national content distribution, there were only three outlets. And so whatever they decided was prime time uh, information. That's what we all accepted. And we rarely questioned it. We just accepted, okay, this is what it is. And by the way, you better be there Thursday at eight o'clock or you're going to miss it. And there was no such thing as recording it right back then, right? <laughs> But as we have moved forward in time, we've seen technology broaden the opportunity for more and more voices, more and more platforms are now available for more content. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're seeing more authentic or more diverse content. I guess it is more diverse, but it's still largely being told from someone else's perspective. Right. Even those of us who get an opportunity to participate often are fulfilling someone else's will for how our stories and how, how our community should be represented. Um, the more and more platforms that become available, the more opportunity there is for us to seize on that and to be independent thinkers about the way in which we tell story, um, be more independent and more communal at the same time uh, with our own community's interest at, at, in mind. That makes perfect sense. Um, how long has the Hollywood Bureau for the NAACP existed? When did? Well, uh, the NAACP has been around for 115 years and um, just seven years into our founding, we waged our very first campaign that dealt with Hollywood. Okay. Uh, D.W. Griffith, the famed director, put out a film called Birth of a Nation. I, yeah. And it was an adaptation from a novel called The Klansman. Yeah. And the, the filmmaking was incredible. Uh, the tech and the production techniques, when you consider it was only 1915, mm -hmm. when, you, when you look at all of the technological advancements that were made or used in that film, it's really, really uh, impressive. Yeah, it's However, to watch. <laughs> the storytelling itself is a problem. Watch. It's yeah. really a problem. The story is about the Reconstruction era in the South right after the Civil War. And it was a deliberate effort to cast us as inhuman, um, as uh, unworthy of our freedom. And it was actually intended to stoke fear amongst whites in the South. So that it would rise up. And so in the film, the, the, the heroes of the film are the Ku Klux Klan. Well, what we noticed was that upon the release of that film, the membership of the Klan spiked. Yeah. And so did the number of lynchings. Uh, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, uh, saw fit to make it the first film ever screened oh, inside the White House, which was a huge badge of endorsement, right? Um, and so the NAACP got involved and attempted to have the film banned in cinemas all across the country. We were unsuccessful with that campaign, but we stayed on the watch. And so every year, every five years, every decade that has transpired since, we have found a need to engage with the industry to talk about some of the content that's being produced and to convince them to do better. We've had some very successful campaigns. 
But to answer your question, finally, it was only 22 years ago, I think, that the, uh, the association decided to actually launch a Hollywood Bureau. There's only two bureaus within the association. There's the Hollywood Bureau, and then there's the, the Washington DC Bureau, which leans into legislative initiatives. But our responsibility is to stay on this Hollywood beat because we understand that's two sides of the same coin. If we can influence the way the messages and, and the images are being produced, then that will ultimately influence the policy making that happens in, in Washington. Absolutely. And speaking of influencing and letting people know about all the things, Be yeah. In Biz is coming to Philly, which I am very excited about, especially when I looked at the lineup, which includes your incredible wife, who has literally created some of my favorite shows of all time, <laughs> including Living. Yeah, and by the way, and another Philadelphian, by the way. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> this is amazing. So please yeah. tell me all I about it. I tease her, she moved from Philly to LA when she was about five years old. So I tell her she doesn't really have the flavor, but um, <laughs> she has been very successful. And thank you for, for acknowledging that. Um, yes, Yvette Lee Bowser is gonna be our keynote speaker at the luncheon at uh, Be In The Biz, which is this Saturday, June 29th. Um, but we have a full day of uh, panel discussions with some really, really impressive panelists, speakers who were flying in from, from Los Angeles, bringing down from New York by train um, to share this information. We're gonna be at 36th and Market Streets at a building called Quorum. Um, and we start at nine in the morning. We have panels about writing and directing and what it means to be a representative, an agent, an attorney, a business manager, a publicist. We have a conversation, really interesting conversation about the collaboration between creatives and executives, because that's how things really get done. We, we all have our creative vision, but ultimately we have to convince someone to invest in them and to support that with marketing and, and the like. And so we have to collaborate. So there's a whole discussion about that. Um, and then of course, my favorite conversation is gonna be the one about media advocacy, which is how do we use media to not only entertain, but to really make an, imp an impact in, in terms of the social justice movement that has always been afoot in this nation. That's amazing. And I know you're a Philadelphia native, so I'm sure that's part of the reason that, that you wanted to bring uh, this incredible event here. Sure. Um, but what really sparked it, like let's take LA and all of these incredible people that are successful there and bring them to Philadelphia to share this wealth of information. Yeah, you know, um, interesting how things work out. So I went back to Disney and said, listen, we talked about this years ago. We weren't able to get it off the ground. I think now is the right time and they agreed. And so this time we do have some support from the Walt Disney Company in doing this, which means uh, six ABC is also being very supportive of us. Uh, the Philadelphia Sunday Sun has been very supportive of us. Uh, WURD Radio has been supportive. WDAS and Power 99 have been very supportive. We have gotten all of the media outlets in Philadelphia that we could reach to say, yes, let's, let's help you with this thing because Philadelphia has always been a hotbed of creativity. It has. It kind of ebbs and flows at times, but there's never a shortage of very, very creative and innovative thinkers here in Philadelphia. And that's why we wanted to, to sort of lead this Be In The Biz tour right here in Philly. So this Saturday on June 29th at 36th and Market Street, we're going to kick it off. That's amazing. And for people that want to find out more information about the event, if they want to sign up, participate, where would they go to find out more? You can go to NAACP, well, let me say it right, NAACP.org. When you get there, search Be In The Biz, B-I-Z. And that's where you'll see all the information. That's where you can register. Um, you can see who all the panelists are. You can see what times the panelists begin. Um, we're going to have breakfast food in the morning. We're going to have this luncheon with the keynote address in the middle of the day. And then we're going to have a little networking mixer at the end with some hors d'oeuvres as well. So we're going to feed folks all day long, give them great information. I don't know how you say no to this. I don't either. It sounds amazing. So I will see you on Saturday. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Sun Spotlight. 
Be in the Biz will take place this Saturday, June 29th from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. at the Quorum located at 3675 Market Street. To find out more information about the event and to purchase your tickets, be sure to visit NAACP.org and type in Be In The Biz. To keep up with me and all that I'm up to, you can follow me on Instagram at The Real Charisma, on Twitter and TikTok at Real Charisma, and then head on over to my YouTube channel, Charisma Music, where you can check out some of my latest performances. And while you're online, be sure to like and follow the Philadelphia Sunday Sun on all social media platforms. I'll be back next Thursday at noon with a brand new episode, and I hope to see you there. Until then, love and light.